This episode of the Local Hustlers podcast is brought to you by Audible. If you're listening to this podcast right now, then I'm going to assume that you would also enjoy listening to audiobooks. Whether you're interested in business, history, comedy, science fiction, or romance, Audible has thousands of titles for you to choose from. We want you to try out Audible for free, so if you head to our link, you'll get a 30-day free trial and a free book. So go to audibletrial.com slash local hustlers podcast to redeem your trial today. Again, that's audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E, trial.com slash local hustlers podcast. You're listening to the Local Hustlers Podcast, your go-to source for connecting with small businesses and entrepreneurs in the East Valley. Get ready to be inspired by local entrepreneurs as they share their stories, mindset, best tips, and advice. And now, your co-hosts, Dallin and Eric Huso. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Local Hustlers Podcast. This week, we're super excited to be here with Frank Sheldon with Armor Protection Group. How's it going, Frank? It's going well. How are you? We're good. Doing We're great. Good. Great to have you here today. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Take a few minutes before we jump into the business and give us a little bit of a background on your life. Oh, wow. Um, background on my life. Uh, I grew up just outside of Detroit. Um, lived there till I was approximately 21, 22 years old. And at that point, I just got sick of the snow and moved from the uh, Detroit area down to South Florida. Uh, lived there for about six, seven years before moving out west and uh, came out to Phoenix. Lived here for a year, moved to Vegas for a year, and then came back to Phoenix, and I've been here ever since. Wow. So I've been all over the place. I am quite the uh, nomad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like to refer to myself as a sun chaser. Yeah. You know, and after being in Florida for a few years, I realized that it was just too wet. Uh-huh. So came out here, and now that I've been out here, it's... You know, I can't really see myself anyplace else. We got sunshine, we've got dry weather, we've got mountains. Yeah. You know, I mean, other than moving to California to get the beaches, but other than that, what can you do? Right. So you came here, then you left, and you came back. Correct. Was there For something work. that? Oh, so we worked at. It was. Back? It was actually work. Uh, at the time, I had taken a break from security oh. and was into uh, real estate and mortgages. Oh wow. So I had uh, moved out to Vegas to run a loan modification office. Um, when the loan modification and when the housing market crashed last time. So, and uh, after doing that for a little bit, moved back and uh, got back into regular mortgages, kept, you know, kind of going with security on and off. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Yeah. So going back, um, did you go to college at all? Or what was your, you know, original path when you first got into the workforce? Um, No, no, never been to college. Um, Completely self-taught on everything I do. Um, I like to think that all the different businesses and industries that I've worked in kind of prepared me to do what I do now, Um, you know, between doing the mortgages and, you know, having some business administration skills Mm -hmm. and uh, did low voltage electronics, which gave me, you know, the background and knowledge when it comes to access control systems, closed caption TV, security cameras, things like that. And were you working in security as a, as a different job for a while before starting something up on your own? Um, yes, I have done, wow, about 25 years of different types of security. Oh, wow. Um, you know, from uh, the original security or the, the first security job I had was doing large event security for a company outside of Michigan. Um, we were doing security for the Pontiac Silverdome, where the Detroit Lions and Pistons used to play yep. when I was oh, a really? kid. Yep. Yep. Um, so we were doing usher work and taking tickets, things of that nature. And, uh, I was just pretty much, you know, graduating high school when I got that job and it's kind of spun off from there. You know, I've done that. I've done bars, nightclubs, concert venues, contract security, commercial security, corporate security, IT security, pretty much everything under the sun. Mm. What sort of drew you towards that industry? Um, I think it's the live music. (laughs) <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm quite the uh, fan of live music. Mm-hmm. Um, I like being around large crowds. Um, you know, I like keeping people safe. Yeah. Um, you know, as you grow up, you start learning that there's kind of a good balance between having fun and being able to stay safe while you have fun, you know. And, uh, you know, at this point, I like taking my kids to concerts. You know, they've been to a bunch of different music festivals, things of that nature. And, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of continue to strive to get back into and, and stay in event security. But at the same time, event security doesn't necessarily 
you know, produce revenue 24 seven, not in the Phoenix market, you know, so you got to have a, a balance between doing commercial and, and corporate and construction security. And then obviously fall into your event security nights, weekends, you know, things yeah. like that. So, yeah. so you kind of get a free ticket to all the events then when you're sitting there security, sometimes, sometimes, you know, and, and I've been doing this so long, especially now here in the Valley that you start learning the who's who in the industry, you uh-huh. know, and, and you start learning who the, you know, the venue owners are and the different promoters are and things like that. So even if you're not working, you know, you tend to get into some concerts for oh, free nice. from time to time. So yeah. can't complain. Sure. And was that yeah. one of your initial drivers as a teenager when you got that job right out of high school at the Silver Dome that, hey, I get to watch Pistons games. I get to watch Lions games. Was that one of your motivations to get it, that job or did you just randomly hey, this is a job and I, I'm going to apply for it. it. It was a job that I just came across. And when I did it, I was so new at it and so young that I was outside, you mm-hmm. know. So I didn't really get to see much of the shows when I first started doing it. You know, and it wasn't until I got a little bit older and got a little bit larger and, <laughs> you know, started being able to handle myself around the, the large crowds. And, you know, that it became where I go from being outside and just a little ticket taker and usher to being, you know, the guy standing behind the barricade in front of the performers and, yeah. you know, backstage and all that stuff. So, yeah. So throughout this process, were you, did you have plans and intentions on starting your own thing one day or, you know, when did you initially stumble upon that idea or that plan? It's, you know, it kind of fell in my lap, to be honest with you. Um, I had worked at doing different types of security at so many different places Um, when I moved out West from Florida, I really wasn't sure if I was going to keep doing security or not. Mm -hmm. And so I got into doing real estate and mortgages and things like that. And yeah, it just, uh, I had some friends that were working here that knew I had a security background and and experience and they were like, Hey, why don't you come work with our company and, and do some weekend work and some, you know, moonlighting and make some money, having some fun. And that was actually the first time I licensed for security was when I moved out here. And um, I had worked doing weekend and moonlight security for probably two years. Um, And the company that I was working for part-time, they ended up having some issues with the manager that was running the security division. The guy owned a a whole conglomerate of companies, um, you know, that were all industry related. He had a bail bonds company and um, he had a fugitive recovery company. He had a security division, things like that. And, he was having issues with his security manager and I kind of just made a proposition to him. I was like, I can take over your security company and, and help you build it. And, you know, within a year of doing that, I had the city of Phoenix as a client and uh, a few other marquee businesses and, and municipalities and clients here in the Valley. And I worked for that gentleman for, oh, wow. Um, I would have to guess probably about five, six years. Um, the only problem is, is through the transition of building the security company for him, um, I had found out that he wasn't paying his payroll taxes. Hmm. So it was just a matter of time before the IRS was beaten down the door. And so I made sure that I had a backup plan and was able to kind of save the jobs of my employees mm-hmm. and make sure that we could continue to facilitate services for our clients. Yeah. And at that point, I had found somebody else that was qualified and able to uh, kind of have their own security company. So I went and legalized his security company here in Arizona with the Department of Public Safety. And uh, just by force, we ended up moving all of our resources over and built that company. Um, I'd say that company probably tripled in size. And after a few years of working for that gentleman, we just kind of kept button heads. And finally, it was time to say, Time to do it for myself. You know, I had spent better part of over a decade building successful security companies for other people. Yeah. You know, and at that point I was qualified and, and experienced enough to start a company for myself. And I had learned watching the mistakes of all these other people that had, you know, started companies and they had failed for one reason or another. And uh, the rest is kind of history. I just, you know, I like to think that I've got building security companies down to like a recipe at this point, (laughs) you know, after you've done it so many times and you start from scratch and you build it up and then something happens to where you have to start over again. Um, you know, I've done it so many times that, you know, why do it for anybody else besides myself at this point? Right. You know, how many years ago was that Frank that you started your own? 
2018. I 2018. incorporated, yep, okay, I incorporated so. my company in 2018. Um, and then with the licensing process, you actually can't start providing services in the state of Arizona until you've got a license through the Department of Public Safety. So my license wasn't in place for me to be able to provide services to you know a client base until September of 2018. Um, so I started in 2018 in September, actually providing services. And then we were all hit with the lovely COVID experience, you know, which considering the basis of my background all relies on event security. I had a whole calendar full of event clients that disappeared all within a week, you know, and, and for somebody starting a new business, it's kind of scary when you've got all this work and you've got all these employees and then all of a sudden you've got nothing even though you've got a license and you've got all your insurances in place and, you know, all your different processes, procedures, yeah. you know, and then having to just start all over and say, Hey, well, where are we going to get the next client from? What kind of clients are going to be, you know, we need to get people working. People are relying on this money to, you know, whether it's to feed their families and pay their bills or whether it's just fun money for them and it's just weekend work. Right. Either way, you got to kind of pick up the pieces and, you know, figure out how to navigate your way around situations that you've never been in. Yeah, I want to dig into how you did that. But before we do that, I'd like to, to hop back one step. So was it like 2014, 2015 that you uh, left the first company that you started with the one gentleman and started the second company with another gentleman? Well, the, the funny thing is, is uh, and I wouldn't necessarily call it funny, but it's, it's kind of ironic, is I started the first company and uh, it was probably 2000, it was probably 2012, when I took over with building his security company and within two years of building his security company, like I was saying, he, he wasn't paying his payroll taxes. So I had brought on another gentleman to do sales and the gentleman was uh, extremely experienced in, in administration and sales and things like that. And he had the idea of rebranding the security company. So what we had done is we what I thought was rebranding, um, but little did we know that the owner of the first company, it gave him the opportunity to change company names, change his licensing, try and evade his taxes a little bit further. And uh, we ended up changing the company name over, changed the license over, and started a second company at that point, or a, you know, started the second company. And uh, a few months after starting that second company, we ended up doing the Super Bowl was in town that year. So we ended up with a large chunk of the Super Bowl contract um, as far as doing security around the NFL experience in downtown Phoenix and things like that. And right around the time we did the Super Bowl was when I started having indication that there was financial troubles. Um, we had ended up getting a very large check to pay us off for our services for the Super Bowl contract. And within a few days of cashing that check or depositing that check, the payroll on a lot of our employees bounced, you know? So ultimately right then I knew that there was something going on that wasn't at least made known to me prior to that. Um, so we kind of had given the, myself and then the general manager um, who I had hired, he was essentially the sales guy, but moved into a general manager position. I stayed on the operational side and we had had a few sit down meetings with the owner, letting him know you know, hey, we need you to straighten this up. We can't continue to, to have our employees come back saying that their paychecks are bouncing or they can't cash their checks, you know, because there's no money in the bank. You know, when you deposit $90,000 in the bank and need to clear a $50,000 payroll two or three days later and half the paychecks bounce, there's apparently a problem, you know. Um, so we gave them a, a few warnings and had some sit down talks and um, continued to get IRS garnishment and, you know, um, account levy letters in the mail from the IRS. And after so long, it was, you know, it, it kind of came to a head with an ultimatum, either you're going to fix this or we're going to walk, you know, and, and essentially that's what ended up happening was a combination of us walking and being forced out and, uh, us kind of moving our resources over to the, what would have been the third company. Uh, the third company is actually still in business here in the Valley. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it just kind of went from there. I worked with that guy and built that company up and, you know, he kept working on sales and I kept building everything from an operational standpoint. And, you know, we were just 
two completely indivi- different individuals and, and didn't see eye to eye after a while. And, you know, I wanted out as much as he wanted me gone, it seemed like. And, you know, at that point, like I said, I knew I could do it on my own. So I really didn't need anybody else's help. Um, I had had all the experience that I needed and was able to verify on paper to be able to qualify for a license through the state of Arizona and uh, kind of just went that route and we s- split up, parted ways. I took my severance check and, you know, started a new company. That's great. Mm-hmm. What I wanted to dig into, and you mentioned that you got the necessary qualifications to qualify for the license yourself. I just wanted to kind of dig into your mindset shift. Why this last time you're like, I can do this on my own. Like I'm qualified. I have the experience versus uh, you didn't really think that the first time you left and started a new company with somebody else. Just want to kind of dig into the growth in your mindset to give you the confidence to say, hey, this is my time. I'm prepared. I'm ready to start my own business. You know, it wasn't necessarily a change in the mindset as much as it was meeting the qualifications. Um, I'm one of the few people in the state of Arizona that is a security agency owner that is not a former law enforcement officer or former military. You know, I would say probably 95% of people that own security agencies in the state of Arizona meet one of those two qualifications. Um, And if you don't meet one of those two qualifications, the state of Arizona and the Department of Public Safety require that they have documented verifiable experience in a management position within a security agency before they will grant a license to somebody that doesn't meet the law enforcement officer or military veteran qualification. So I had to at least show to the department that I had a minimum of five years of experience in that role before they would grant me a license. Um, You know, at the same time, through the transitions of different companies, I've lost a lot of good people. You know, I've had people that you know, decided to stay with past companies, people that have jumped out of the industry, things like that. You know, and in hindsight, I probably would have taken one of those people and put them into that qualifying party role and still built them a security company and and probably partnered with them. But, you know, I, I have no regrets at the same time. You know, I don't have any partners. I don't have anybody to answer to besides myself. Hmm. So, I mean, it, it all worked out the way it should have. So for those, you know, especially that first company that you uh, kind of started working with to grow the company, I'm curious what that conversation looked like. Did you have um, a piece of ownership in the company, any sort of stake where you benefited financially as the company grew, or were you just working like as a manager to grow the company and and that's all it was? Yeah, I, I mean, I was given a lot of verbal promises, mm-hmm. um, you know, but there was never anything in paper. And, and I got to the point where I showed a lot of these company owners loyalty and, uh, you know, wasn't shown the loyalty in return. Um, so there was never really anything on paper. And, and because there wasn't, you know, in the long run, I ended up getting burned. You yeah. know, even if there would have been something in paper, or, you know, in writing with the first guy that I built the security company for, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill it anyways when the IRS comes knocking at your door saying, where's our money, you know? So um, there was really never anything you know, documented. And, and same thing with the second guy. I mean, it was, it was just management roles and, you know, I was a salaried manager and, and as the company grew, the salary grew. Um, but th- there was never really anything that guaranteed me the longevity of, of, you know, wealth or, or anything ongoing beyond building them their companies. Um, so, you know, at the same time, I, I kind of look forward to being able to change that. Um, you know, my plan in the future is to be able to give my employees part stock in the company that we're building now. Um, just because I know that there's a lot of times where people, they utilize their resources and they give you their, their blood, sweat and tears to help build something, you know, and, and in the long run they get burned, you know, um, it, the last 15 years, you know, or so I, I've, really seen how the security industry really lacks loyalty and integrity. You know, it, it's a very cutthroat business. You know, there's a lot of companies out here that are, you know, willing to undermine each other, you know, and willing to underbid each other on pricing, um, you know, and, and in the long run, all it does is it hurts the industry and it hurts the individuals working in the industry. Because when you start cutting prices to undermine your competition, who's, 
who's the, the group of people that actually feel that the most? The employees, because yeah. they have to get paid less, you know? Um, so it's one of those things where if you can continue to grow and not undermine your competition and try and actually grow with the industry, you can go a long way, you know? And, and if you show your employees that you actually appreciate what they do for you and your company, then they're going to stick by you and be loyal, you know? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's pretty much the, the basis of that. That's great. Besides, obviously, money and, and having their checks not bounce and, and cash when you pay them on payroll, what are other ways that you build that loyalty with your security officers? You know, the, the biggest thing is is not expecting them to do anything that you wouldn't do. You know, I'm, and uh, I've never asked an employee to do anything that I haven't, won't, or wouldn't do, you know, um, and, and my employees see it. You know, I, from the basis of me starting this company all the way up until the point where we're at now, my employees that have been with me the whole time, they've seen the transition of the company grow. You know, they've seen me out there on sites. They've come out there and relieved me after I've worked one of the shifts and now they have to take over and work that shift before I come back the next day and work that shift. You know, so in the beginning, you're your first employee, you know, and as the company grows, not only do the roles grow, but you have to be able to keep up with those roles and be able to do every different job, you know, from standing a post to, you know, going out and selling to running a team of people, you know, to, like you said, making sure that payroll's done and their paychecks don't bounce. You know, right now I'm getting ready to take the next step and have benefits set up for my employees. And I'm also getting ready to set up a patrol division. So we're actually going to have a mobile patrol uh, probably start off with two or three vehicles canvassing the whole valley and uh, just grow that from there, you know, and like I said, it's it's a recipe and you do it step by step and, you know, you just make sure that you roll with the punches on any obstacles that are thrown your way and you know, overcome. Yeah. Having that mindset with your employees, do you see a difference in the relationship that you have with them versus maybe the relationship that you had with your previous employers and a difference in how it makes you act or, or perform your job? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like it, it, it allows them, or I should say it, it gains me a lot more respect for my employees, Yeah, you know, because like I said, it, it, when it comes down to it, I might be the guy that signs the paychecks, but at the same time, when we've got a job and we're doing a big job and there's 20, 30, 40 employees out there, the fact that they see me and I'm out there and I'm, you know, doing the job with them and I'm dealing with the public and I'm, you know, going out and, and buying pizza for the whole team and, you know, assigning radios and doing dispatch and all that stuff. You know, I, I think that that gives them confidence knowing that I'm just not going to leave them out there in the weeds and just try and collect money and, and make money off of right. their heads without being able to get myself in the trenches, should I say, yeah. and, and work right alongside of them. That's awesome. Going back to one other thing that you talked about, your, your partnership that didn't necessarily work out. Um, looking back on that, is there anything that you see now that maybe you feel like you could have done differently anything that you've learned since then? Or is it just one of those things where you know not everyone is meant to work together and different personalities just don't always clash? Or are there things where you feel like you know if you, you know, change your mindset around a certain thing that you can make certain partnerships work? Um, I, I mean, I guess at the same time, I've worked with so many different people and had so many different people work with me or, mm -hmm. or even, you know, alongside me or beneath me it, in any industry. I think that it's important to be able to work with people that you don't always necessarily get along with. But at the same time, when you look at the vision of a company, you know, and, and you're building a company for somebody else, there's obviously going to be times where you come across things and, and your vision might be different than the owner's vision of the direction that the company's yeah. going, you know, and, and I can tell you that, you know, with my basis in, in event security, I know that the last guy that I built a company for, or, you know, grew a company for, he wanted nothing to do with event security. You know, he was a former law enforcement officer, former military, you know, and, and he just wanted to have, commercial security going with his guards, you know, whether it was a construction site, a shopping center, you know, a, a, an apartment complex, you know, he, he was just a, you know, the type of guy that wanted that continuous revenue, mm -hmm. you know, and he didn't like having to deal with the influx of work that would come on the nights and weekends 
to where you would need an influx of employees, you right. know, because that would obviously, it impacts overtime, things of that nature, you know. Yeah. And so why do you like that? If that's something that a lot of people stay away from, what draws you towards that as, as a business owner? The crowd and the music. Mm -hmm. I love the energy of a live music crowd. You know, I, I, I like being able to, to see everybody and, and look around and see everybody singing along with the music. Yeah. You know, people smiling, having a good time. And it doesn't matter whether it's a concert or a, a street fair or a festival or whatever. I mean, I, I truly enjoy watching people enjoy themselves or have fun. You know, and, and when you get out on some of these commercial sites, most of the people that you're dealing with, you know, are, are less than favorable people, you know, because you get onto some of these apartment complexes or construction sites and primarily you're there to, to deter crime, you know, where when you get on some of these event sites, you're actually there to, to monitor people's safety and make sure that everybody's having fun. Yeah. So it's, it's a completely different type of security. And at the same time, I find the commercial security is boring, you know, to be honest with you. Once you've been on job sites where you've got 40, 50 different employees doing 10 to 20 different tasks with 50 to 70,000 attendees or spectators, mm -hmm. going back to having one guard walking around a, a commercial building checking doors and windows is a very simple job, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> So let's go back to, you start your business uh, 2018, late 2018, you're focused on events, you have events lined up and then COVID happens and then you have to scramble and you have to shift just because the environment shifted on you. Yeah. Uh, so talk to us about uh, some of those struggles, some of those decisions you had to make um, and, and, and how that shifting impacted the direction of the business. You know, it... it it really made me think about the survival of the business, you know, and, and I had already done, um, you know, a lot of different things from, you know, social media marketing and web presence and all the, you know, search engine optimization and all, and all the stuff I've learned, you know, from, from a technology standpoint, you know, to try and advertise my business. Um, and to be honest with you, I, before COVID happened, I had a few, you know, a, a nice little handful of commercial clients. You know, but it wasn't nearly enough to sustain the amount of work needed to employ all of my employees. You know, so at that point, it was it was more so of making sure that the employees that were and and are looking for full time work are the first ones called, just as long as they meet the qualification, whether it's a, a client that needs an armed guard or an unarmed guard. You know, and then at the same time, corresponding with the employees that have been loyal for the years that only did event work and part time work, and making sure that their full-time job kept them busy and if their full-time job didn't as soon as something came along you know being able to call them and say hey you know i know it's not full-time and it's not permanent but i know that you're struggling too and we need to keep this together you know so if you got any time i've got some jobs and i'm more than willing to put you on them and we can get you trained and and any extra licenses you need and things of that nature um and you know by my I don't know if it's so much the, by the grace of God or karma, but all of a sudden after COVID happened and, and all of the event clients kind of retracted their jobs and their reservations off the schedule, there became an influx of clients that normally wouldn't have security that now need security. Hmm. And I was lucky enough that the online presence that I had was, was broad enough to be able to kind of start funneling some of those clients into my company. You know, so you had all these different places that normally wouldn't have security. Now their lobbies are closed, but they can't stop their operations because they're essential, you know? So they ended up reaching out saying, Hey, we, we've never had security, but we think we need security. Can you come down and have a meeting with us? And, you know, we want to talk about what's going on here and some of the problems that, that we hope that you guys can help us with. And now that that's, you know, been over a year of, of the situation going on, has that kind of balanced out and are events starting to come back up for you or what is, what does the landscape kind of look like now? They are, and I'm ecstatic. Okay. They are. So, um, now it's, it's definitely a, a balance. Um, you know, I, it's gotten to the point where, you know, right after COVID started, it seemed like the biggest event or the most common event type of work we would do would be COVID testing for the municipalities, <laughs> yeah. you know? You, you would go and help hand out clipboards at, at the local fire department for people that are driving through the fire station to get a COVID test. Yeah. 
you know, and, and not now, a lot of live music there, right? No, no, definitely not. Um, you know, and, and now it's kind of getting to the point where a lot of the, uh, the music venues are coming back. You've got different municipalities and different, uh, event promoters and, and wedding planners and things like that, or they're starting to get back to normal, you know, as normal as we can be considering everything keeps changing between vaccine, no vaccine, yeah. negative test, no negative test, you know, mask, no mask. Um, but we are starting to see a lot of these event clients come back around, which is great, you know, to see that some of these clients that we had before were able to weather the storm as well. Um, but it, it definitely creates a nice balance and it definitely excites me seeing that we're hopefully getting back to normal, you know, and, yeah. and at the same time, I, I like where the business has gone simply for the fact that I've already been able to weather the storm, you know, so it is a nice balance of event type clients and commercial type clients, you know, so no matter what happens, the business will continue to sustain, will continue to grow, will continue to employ more people. And at the same time, if we continue to go in this direction and getting back to everything being normal, I would say again, then the fun jobs are right around the corner yeah. and they're already starting to funnel in. That's awesome. So it sounds like the pandemic really set you up to have a well-balanced portfolio of clients to sustain the ebbs and flows of really whatever the world could bring. Absolutely. Got the absolutely. best of both worlds with the events and the commercial. Yep, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, it's it's one of those things. And at the same time, you know, it's the company has been able to grow at a, at a nice organic pace um, to where it's been able to allow me to start getting middle management in place. You know, like I said in the beginning, I was doing everything from the hiring, the firing, the, the scheduling, writing policy, um, setting up corporations and incorporating the business and compliance and you know payroll and all that stuff and and now it's kind of where I'm trying to take it to the next level and and make sure that as we continue to bring in more people and the company grows that that pyramid grows you know and I start yeah. getting the middle management in there so that I'm not the one doing everything you know now I got somebody that does the hiring and the firing and the disciplinary I've got somebody that does the dispatch and the scheduling and things like that you know and and one thing that I pride myself on is I build excellent teams of diverse, dynamic people, you know. And I think that most jobs or most industries out there, you have to be able to be a people person if you want to build a business, you know. So being able to recognize people's strengths and recognize even their weaknesses and, and being able to help them on their weaknesses and capitalize off of their strengths and, and giving your people within your organization the opportunity to move up and grow and promote within is an excellent thing, you know? So I, I think that it's it's been one of those things where it's a positive thing and it's also definitely been a stress relief to me, you know, because now I'm not the one trying to go out and stand a post at two in the morning yeah. and then get up the next day to find somebody else to work because of a call off and things like that. And, you know, I kind of just learn, or I should say, I've learned how to let go and teach people how to do the job the way I want it done and let them kind of run with it and, and let them grow on their own as well within the company. Yeah. Do you find yourself spending more time cleaning your pool than you spend swimming in it? Then you need to get in touch with Flamingo Pools. Flamingo Pools is your go-to swimming pool maintenance and repair company in the East Valley. Whether it's weekly maintenance, repairs, green to cleans, or one-time cleanings, Flamingo Pools is there to take care of you. Here's a few things that makes Flamingo Pools stand out from the crowd. When you first sign up for service, they'll give you a free complimentary inspection of the pool to make sure everything is running smoothly. They'll also email you a service report with a picture attached after every visit so you know when your pool has been cleaned. They also offer a mineral treatment, which will keep your chemical levels down, allowing you to have a healthier bathing experience. At Flamingo Pools, they know that your pool was made to be enjoyed, so let them handle the rest. Check them out at azflamingopools.com or give them a call at 480-422-6013. Mention this podcast and get your first month of weekly maintenance free. That's azflamingopools.com and 480-422-6013. I'd love to hear a bit more about that middle management um, and just kind of what the process has been. Maybe the first thing that you initially outsource or what you feel like the most important thing is that you kind of took off your plate um, and what you've been able to, you know, focus on now as you've been able to, to hire other people to take care of the tasks that were taking up the majority of your time. I'll tell you what, there's, well, as far as outsourcing, it, 
there's really nothing that's outsourced with the exception of I've brought on a, a an outsourced ins- insurance agent, um, you know, whether it be my general liability and my workers' comp, you know, which in security, your general liability and your workers' comp is a very narrow selection as far as insurance carriers, especially once they find out that you do armed security. So it's very challenging when you go to that annual renewal on your insurance, you know, depending on how much the business has grown, if you've had any claims, things like that. Um, So I tend to try and stay with insurance brokers that specialize in servicing the security industry. And then same thing with the, um, you know, the benefits for the employees. I've actually got a local broker that I use and uh, she's actually helped me with multiple companies in the past. And uh, I've kind of set her up to do all the benefits and things like that. But other than that, as far as what I've done to take some of the, the workload off of my plate in the beginning, when you get to a certain level and a certain amount of employees, depending on if you want the company to grow and which way you want it to grow, Mm -hmm. your biggest thing is going to be your scheduling, you know, because you're always going to have people calling out, you're running a 24 hour business, you know, so there's no days off, you know, we've got people working every single holiday, 24 hours around the clock, you know, so being able to have somebody dedicated to just making sure that all the shifts are covered. And when somebody calls out, we get somebody else to replace that person. Um, you know, and, and right after getting somebody to handle the dispatch and the scheduling, your next important thing is to make sure that you've got somebody to handle your, your hiring and your firing, you know, because those two people have to work in conjunction with each other, you know, very symbiotically. Yeah. Um, you know, and once you get those two positions covered by people that are competent and know what they're doing, um, beyond that, it allows me the extra time to start focusing on things like sales, growth, you know, employee benefits. Um, things of that nature, different divisions, starting up a patrol, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. How do you make sure that when you delegate and hire someone specifically for like hiring and firing, that they are basically an extension of you and what you would want and and hiring the people that you would want to bring into your company versus, you know, their own thoughts of, of who they think the right hire should be? I think that that's just first finding somebody that has experience in that role, mm-hmm. you know, um, and then training them to do it the way that you want it done. Uh, I like to tell people that I, I'm very transparent in the way that I build my businesses, you know, and I give everybody the feedback, you know, whether it's my employees or my clients and, and much more so when it's my employees, whether it's negative or positive feedback, you know, and, and the gentleman that I hired to do my scheduling and dispatch management, he had been a scheduler for another company. You know, but the type of company he came from was completely different than the type of company that I'm building, you know, so it was more so just taking the experience and the knowledge that he had about scheduling and shifting it from a security company that was doing only and all patrols into a security company that actually does commercial security with guys on foot, you know, and and large events, you know, and, and kind of teaching him the ropes and the different softwares and systems that we use, Mm -hmm. you know, and and then same thing with the hiring manager, you know, Uh, she was actually somebody that I promoted from within as well. She had experience in HR and in training. Um, And then I kind of just took her and, and made sure that she had the opportunity to go around and, and see and work all of our different sites to see exactly what happened and what the different job duties and tasks were and what the scope of work was. Yeah. And then that way, when it comes time to hire for any of those sites, she knows exactly what we're looking for. That's awesome. And for you, when did you know that it was the right time to start delegating and start getting people to take these tasks off you? And for, you know, a business owner that is kind of at the position where they're getting super busy and they're considering whether it's right timing wise or financially to hire someone, how did you kind of know when it was the right time to start taking that next step? Well, the, the finances definitely dictate it, but as a company owner, once you're trying to do 30 hours worth of work in a 24 hour period, well, <laughs> you know, building a business and, and trying to balance my home life and, and my professional life, yeah. you know, it, it kind of was just one of those things where I, I had recognized their ability, knew that the finances and, and everything of the company was there to, to be able to take on those extra expenses and that I wouldn't be able to grow without making sure that I had somebody competent and qualified to take over those tasks. Yeah. 
to where I can kind of step back and, and make sure that they're doing it the way that it needs to be done and the way that I like it done. And then go out and then focus on selling more and bringing on more employees, you know, and, and trying to make sure that the employees that we're hiring on for the new clients are, are a good fit, yep. you know. That was going to be my question because for the solopreneur, sometimes it's hard to let go of things. You've done them all yourself. You have a certain way of doing it. The, you know, the, the fear of letting go, the fear of, you know, will I have enough money to pay this person's salary now that I'm bringing on as opposed to me just doing it myself. But what gets lost in that is what you gain by delegating and, and hiring other people, what you're able to focus on what your unique gifts and skill set are that you're able to use to really grow the business. And you mentioned selling uh, and, and hiring people. Anything else that you've really been able to hone in and focus on and, and, and that have re resulted in you growing the business because you've been able to delegate some of these other lower level tasks? I, I would definitely say yes. And I think it's, like I said, my people skills. I, I I can look at somebody, and, and especially after working with somebody for a while, I can, like I said, kind of look at them and, and figure out after working with them for a while what their strengths and weaknesses are, you know, and, and just like anything, whether it's a job or, or any kind of a, a hobby or anything like that, you're always going to have mistakes, you know, you're, you're always, everybody's always learning, you know, and the big thing is to try and correct people instead of discipline them when they're not doing things the way they need to be done or even the way you need them done. You know, and I can tell you that there's been multiple times through transitioning employees from within and promoting them to where mistakes have been made. And I've had to run out and go and work a shift, you know, and, and stop eating dinner with my family. And, you know, because the scheduler missed this shift or because this person didn't show up to work, you know, and, and part of being the business owner is, is making sure that all that stuff runs smooth, whether you got to jump back in and do it or help them, you know, but I offer both, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's, there's not a time where I'm not talking to, you know, one of my mid-level managers and saying, do you need my help with this? You know, cause I'm more than willing to jump in, you know, and especially on the scheduling side, because my scheduling manager, there's plenty of times where he comes to me and he's like, I can't get this shift filled. You know, everybody I've tried calling, they don't call back or they tell me no or whatever, you know, and, and, <laughs> He actually jokes with me about it because if I start picking up the phone and having to call these people, they tend to tell me yes a lot more than they tell him yes, especially if they don't want to work, you know. Yeah. So he's always bringing that up. And, and it's probably been the last two or three months where I, I've asked him, you know, do you, do you need my help? Do you want me to jump on the phone and make some calls? Do you want me to take a look at the schedule and, you know, help you figure out how to get all this covered? And, you know, he's like, no, I got it. But any advice and any, you know, any tips you can give me would definitely be much appreciated, you know. So I'm, I'm always willing to help my team. And, you know, the, the way I look at it, the more I can teach them on what I know and what I've learned through my experiences is just going to make them better at what they do and what I've hired them and promoted them to do. Well, that's great. That's great. And... And I'm sure you'll mentor uh, your scheduler in a way where he can develop that way of being where people respond to him the way they respond to you, where they respect him the way they respect you. That'll be a, oh, yeah. a, a gift for him. Yeah. Uh, one other question, uh, you know, as a small business owner, you're always on call, obviously, right? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And I think that's magnified in your industry. That's Absolutely. a 365, 24 seven industry, right? Like yep. your work is going on 24 seven every single day, holidays, like yep. Absolutely. there is no vacation from your, what do you do to give yourself some level of downtime? What do you do to, to focus on your wellness where you can vacation, where you can let go to some degree? Um, well, I've, I've got a very delicate balancing act. <laughs> I've got four young kids all in between the ages of one and a half and 12 years old, you know, so they're always doing something, whether it's school related stuff. Um, you know, we try to vacation a lot um, at the same time because it is a 24 hour business. When I go anywhere, I usually don't go anywhere without my laptop and my cell phone. You know, I mean, when we do our family road trips and, and it could be anywhere in the country, you know, there's a lot of times where I'm sitting passenger seat 
while my significant other is driving and I'm sitting there hammering away on the laptop using the Wi-Fi in the van running payroll, you know, and we'll be driving through the middle of Oklahoma or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. But um, as far as what I... the what I like to do to, to kind of balance that is, is try and make sure that I'm home with the kids every morning. You know, I try to make sure that I get home by dinner time if possible. Obviously, there's times where I miss that, where I'm out working all day. Um, at the same time, because I like to focus on when I'm on a job site, it being like a larger event type job, we'll bring the kids out. You know, a street fair going on. I'll tell the wifey, go ahead, bring the kids out. There's bounce houses here. There's food vendors, you know, bring them out. We'll make sure they have a good time. And I'll tell the same thing to my employees, you know, just as long as it's not necessarily distracting you, you know, we got to try and make it fun, not only for the employees, but we have to make sure that their families are seeing that balance between work and personal life, you know, and if we as a company can help with that balance, I find that it's it's that much more enriching to the employees as well as their families. Do people running the event or people at the event notice or like that you guys, you know, are enjoying what you're doing there? That, you know, when you're at a, a big live music event that you're, you know, maybe moving around to the music that you enjoy it, you're not all, you know, pissed off and, and don't want to listen to what's going on. Do you notice that people kind of take note of that and enjoy that you guys are like that? I think so. I definitely think so. I mean, there's... There's quite a few large musical artists and celebrities out there that, you know, if, if you're caught watching the show being, you know, one of the security officers at the show, you know, they'll stop the show and they'll call you out, you know, and, and that's the last thing you want is for some kind of a, a large musician or a celebrity to call out one of your employees or, you know, your company, yeah. you know, but at the same time, with respect to the fans, a lot of times the fans at, and, you know, the, the patrons and spectators at a lot of these events really, you know, look at it as we're in a lucky position, you know, you must have the greatest job ever. I, and I hear it all the time. I had to pay a hundred bucks to come exactly. here. You get to do this for free. That's exactly. Yeah. We get, we get to get paid to be there. <laughs> yeah, well, they right. had to pay a hundred dollars to see their favorite, you know, uh, band or performer, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of them are like, you must have the greatest job ever, you know, but it's, it's fun. And then you always have the downside, you know, you're always going to have those people that are over intoxicated, you know, you're, you're always have the potential to, to get yourself into a situation where it could be dangerous. You know, there's, there's plenty of times where I've been in physical altercations at, at different events with people that are over intoxicated, you know, um, luckily a lot of times the, the larger the event, the more, that we've got the support of other first responders. You know, you usually got medics there and you've got fire there and you've got the police there and things like that. And a lot of times that'll make the job easier when you're dealing with super large crowds. Um, but for the most part, it's, like I said, it's finding that balancing act and, and knowing how to talk to people, you know, because if you can avoid physical confrontation by just talking to somebody, everybody wins. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. Have you ever gotten to meet or interact with any musicians or celebrities that you particularly like? Oh, quite frequently. Yeah. Quite frequently. As far as, you know, stories, I, you know, try to stay away from stories just because, <laughs> you know. Protect the identity. Yeah, yeah. protect the identity of the client. And, you know, yeah. at the same time, it's, you're still going to find that even your employees and there's been plenty of times where I've had to go in and tap an employee on the shoulder and whisper in their ear, you know, pay attention to the job. I know you're really enjoying yourself and I know <laughs> you really want to meet this person, but yeah. you need to pay attention to the job. Yeah. You know, because all it takes, like I said, is them to, to act unprofessional or more like a fan than, than they're doing their job and it can kill the, the, the whole reputation of your company. For sure. A couple more things I want to touch on before we close up. Two things that you mentioned earlier. The first is that you talked about providing employee stock to, to your team one day. Um, I just wondered if you could kind of go into that a bit for, for people in a similar situation that have employees. They want to give back to them and show their appreciation to their employees and people that know that the more that you give to your employees and the more that you you know involve them in the business, the more that they're going to in turn help grow the business as well. So just want to hear kind of what that would look like in terms of employee stock, whether that's, you know, a, a recurring payment they get or if it's just, you know, an ownership in the business for when it, if it were to sell one day or just what your thoughts are on what, you know, employee stock would look like for your team. I think that that's something that I, when I started this business, I knew that that was going to be my end goal. Mm -hmm. Now I've 
got some accountants and some financial advisors that I correspond with and work with that, you know, will help me look at some of those different options. Yeah. But I know right from the beginning that when I incorporated the business, that was the whole reason that I did the corporation instead of doing the LLC. Okay. You know, because of being able to do that, that stock and that stock option. Yeah. Um, now, whether it turns out to be just a stock option and they end up with, you know, a dividend check on a monthly basis or whether the company ends up being um, set up to where that stock is actually, you know, given out or sold. Um, and then I end up kind of stepping back or sitting on a board, you know, of directors mm -hmm. and uh, kind of just helping the company go in the direction that I know that it should go in instead of being the sole decision maker on everything. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like you had brought up, it definitely motivates loyalty and and drive to grow a company as well as, you know, be an integral part of the team. Yeah. You know, when somebody knows that they've got, you know, that, that end goal and it's uh, attainable and within their reach, you know, because nobody, like we said earlier, wants to, to go and, and make somebody else rich and not have any future, you know, guarantee for themselves. For sure. So setting up as a corporation allows you to offer that stock sometime in the future? Correct. Awesome. The other thing that you mentioned earlier is that you've been doing this for so long that you've kind of turned um, growing security companies kind of into a recipe that you have down down pat, it sounds like. I was wondering if you could kind of just maybe dive into a couple quick uh, pointers or things that you've learned along the way on what you've been able to do to grow you know, multiple business, businesses as well as your own, especially something... Um, you know, so new to a place where, you know, people are choosing you and hiring you and your company versus companies that have been around for probably a lot longer than you guys. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of it's that transparency. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm just as transparent with my clients as I am with my employees, you know, and, and like I said before, everybody makes mistakes, but what your clients want to know is that you're going to be there and you're going to fix it and you're going to fix it in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times with, your larger companies out there, you've got so many different, you know, chiefs and, and now not to say that you don't have as many Indians with respect to the whole organization, yeah. but with a larger, especially in security, you know, you could be dealing with a, a national or international security company, even though you've just using their services here locally. Well, when something needs to change, a lot of times the people that are on your site don't have the ability or the people that are working for you directly don't have the ability to make those changes, you know? So you have to kind of go up the ladder and talk to your account manager, which could change over and over again, you know, and they have to reach up to a regional, you know, and, and you've got to kind of make those requests that have to go all the way up the chain before a decision is made. And then the decision comes all the way back down the pyramid, you know? So with a smaller business, it gives us the flexibility, um, you know, and the mobility to make changes on a faster time frame. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. And, and the more that I do it and the clients know that I'm going to be there to fix their problem, you know, when a client knows that they've got the owner on speed dial for the company, you know, they tend to get their issues resolved right away. Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, if, if they know that you're going to resolve their issue right away, they're always going to go with a, a smaller local company than some large international or gotcha. national company. For sure. And what does marketing look like for a security company? How do you find your clients or how do your clients find out about you in the first place? Oh man. Oh man. It's, it's a lot of door to door, okay. you know? And, and when I say door to door, it's, it's, you know, you beat the pavement. Yeah. You can, you can go out and, and you can try and promote your company as best as possible online. You know, and, and you have to still learn a combination. You know, um, I'm getting ready to pull one of my other supervisors into a sales position, you know, and I would say probably the first month of what we're going to do as soon as I pull him out of the field and, and pull him and focus him on sales, we're going to get in a car and we're going to go down each road and we're going to canvas and we're going to hit, you know, targeted areas. We're going to hit all the apartment complexes in this targeted area. Then we're going to hit all the construction sites and construction companies in this targeted area. And we're going to go in and we're going to introduce ourselves and show them why, what we're about, you know, and, and show them the benefits of using a, a smaller, newer local company versus using one of these large conglomerate companies. And, uh, you know, just go from there. It's like fishing. The more lines that you cast, the more fish you're bound to catch. That's awesome. 
one more thing I just kind of want to get your your advice or, or perspective or opinion on is, you know, we've talked about how a lot of people kind of stay away from events um, because of, of the downside that comes with that. But you mentioned that it's, it's what you love. And so it sounds like, you know, having a passion for what you do is important to you. And it's not just about the logistics, not just about the finances, although those things are important, but it's also important to you that um, you enjoy what you do. And so I just kind of want to hear, you know, your insight into why it's important that you do have, you know, passion and enjoyment for the work that you do every day. You know, I, I think that it's one of those things that helps you get out of bed every day. You know, it wasn't until I started building security companies and, and heard people say, you know, do what you love and make a job out of it. And it's never a day of going to work, you know, so there I can tell you more than anything this last two years or whatever, since we've been dealing with COVID, I feel like I've been a desk jockey since we <laughs> since we haven't done any events, yeah. you know, but at the same time, you still have to make sure that all those administrative duties are done, Yeah, you know, and and keep your company afloat and, and hopefully, you know, grow. But at the same time, I know that my employees, you know, they, they see that enthusiasm, they see that drive and that motivation, you know, and, and I know that they don't want to just walk around all the time, checking doors and windows and, you know, dealing with undesirable people. So, you know, if I can continue to do what I love doing and make a career and build a company off of it, I think that everybody wins. Yeah. No, I think it's important. Like you mentioned, it's not always immediate that you have, you know, everything you've had to hit the doors for a couple of years, have to work in the office, do what you got to do. It doesn't always come right away. But um, as you're learning, as you continue to do that and work hard at those things and build yourself up, then eventually you get to the point where you don't feel like you're working, where you're just doing the tasks that you enjoy doing. And then it doesn't actually feel like work. Exactly. Exactly. And, it, and it's, it's part of those tasks that you kind of get to the point that you assign to middle management, <laughs> right? you know, and, and then you just make sure that they know that you appreciate the job yeah. that they're doing for you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you try to, to teach them any kind of tips or tricks that they can do to make that job or those tasks easier for themselves. Yeah. You know, um, but other than that, it's, it's all about having fun when you get up and go to work and, and finding some enjoyment in what you do. Like I said, I, I get to go to work and I, you know, sometimes I'm sitting at a desk. Other times I'm, you know, at a concert and, and having a good time and knowing that I'm getting paid and all my employees are enjoying themselves and, you know, the company's growing and, and nothing's better than, than getting that free advertising, you know, because if you've got 40 or 50 security guards that are doing security for a large event, out of those 50, 70,000 spectators and, and attendees that are there, they're all potential clients. You know, they could have any kind of a business or be in any kind of an industry. And if they see your employees doing a good job, you know, that's a bunch of free marketing and advertising right yeah. there. Just by doing what you love to do, you're potentially, you know, uh, I guess, ca catching the attention of all these new potential clients. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Well, I think that's a great place to kind of start wrapping up here. Um, before we close up, we've got a quick game we're going to play with you, Frank. So okay. how it's going to work is we've got a list of 20 questions that we're going to ask you. And you've okay. got a minute to answer as many of them um, as you can. And so we'll see how you do squaring up against other guests we've had on the show. Okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm nervous to hear what kind of questions they are. <laughs> <laughs> and then do you want to start us off in three, two, one. Your dream vacation. What was that? Your dream vacation. My dream vacation? Uh, probably the Maldives. First thing you'd buy if you won a million dollars? Oh, bigger house. <laughs> Your favorite hobby? My favorite hobby? Um, getting tattooed. And if there was an Olympic competition for everyday activities, what activity would you have a good chance at winning a medal in? Ooh. Eating spicy food. A song you've been jamming to lately? Um, hold on to memories by Disturbed. If you lived to be 100, would you rather have the mind or the body of your prime self? The body. <laughs> your favorite holiday? Um, Christmas. I love seeing my kids happy when they open their gifts. Favorite ice cream flavor? Strawberry. Favorite fictional character? Hmm. That's a tough one. Hulk, maybe, I would guess. <laughs> Favorite smell? Favorite smell. And there's our time, but we'll let you answer. Um... Home cooked Italian. Nice. It's hard to beat that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had something about, you know, home cooked Italian, especially on a Sunday, that's, you know, <laughs> always makes me hungry and happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could definitely give Hulk a run for his money, I think. Uh, 
Uh, hopefully. <laughs> Awesome, Frank. Well, we really enjoyed having you on the show today. Um, super uh, insightful, all the things you shared with us. Thanks for um, having me. Yeah. Let our audience know where they can find out more about you, connect with you if they want to learn more about uh, learn more about you and your company. Well, you can uh, find us on the web at armorprotectiongroup.com. And uh, we've actually got a office over at 19th Avenue in Camelback. Address is 5060 North 19th Avenue in Phoenix, Arizona, 85015. Awesome. Um, and I know you have a little special offer for our listeners as well, if you don't mind mentioning that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if anybody is looking for services, we're more than willing to uh, come out and give you a free site assessment and uh, kind of gauge where you're at with, uh, you know, the security and, and the safety of your site or of your property. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the site assessment is, you know, not only going to include, you know, testing your doors, your locks, your windows, things of that nature, also lighting, Um and, and the whole gamut on making sure that your employees, your customers, or your family is safe when they're, you know, at your site. Appreciate it. Well, yeah, thanks again, Frank. It's a bit of pleasure to get to know you today. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Just a few things before we go. First off, if you or someone you know is an entrepreneur in the East Valley, we'd love to have you on the show. Please get in touch with us by emailing us at localhustlerspodcast at gmail.com or DM us on Instagram at localhustlerspodcast. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn for the latest news and updates. Also, if you enjoyed the show, please take a few seconds to rate and review and hit that subscribe button. It lets us know how we're doing and helps us grow so we can reach more locals, entrepreneurs, and help small businesses grow. Thanks, guys.